The world of commerce is changing from a linear product flow to a circular product flow. In order to stay ahead, retailers and manufacturers need to communicate effectively with their audience throughout the entire product journey. The global software company InRiver, based in Sweden, has developed a solution to manage product information. They're working together with more than 1,600 global brands to ensure a data-driven yet sustainable future. I'm Olivia Kinghorst and I'm here in Davos to speak with Neil Stenfield, CEO of InRiver. Niels, welcome to Davos. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you very much for being here. Now, I want to start with you because you joined InRiver as CEO just over a year ago. So why don't you tell us why you decided to take on a share of the company and also become CEO? It was actually very easy. Uh, first of all, being a dad to, to two wonderful sons, I, I felt having spent 20 years into to technology, it was time to have something with a bigger purpose. So uh, I th thought the timing was absolutely right. And then what we do at InRiver is all about product information and allowing consumers to take informed right decision about their purchases. And, and that need I saw coming in the market uh, and the opportunity to use this information to make uh, lower or see lower emissions and, and overall have a positive impact on the earth was basically what drove me. So the mission was there, it was clear to you and it spoke to you. And essentially you're supporting businesses throughout the entire product journey. So walk us through what that really looks like from A to Z. Absolutely, I mean, the product journey is a long journey. Um, so, so let's try to make it a little bit simpler. If you think about it, ever since the Industrial Revolution, companies have been kind of focused on two major things. Producing the product, how many product can you produce as fast as possible at the lowest possible price? And then you had a selling team selling the product, uh, focusing on getting the highest possible price in as many items as possible. And, and the, the interlink between those two teams was that moment in time where the product left the production and got sold or was ready to be sold. That was product information. Very simple moment in time. What is happening now is consumers ask for more and more information. What we know as a product information or the product description is getting longer and longer. With the digital product passports that the European Union is coming on, other legislation that are being uh, in inquired uh, by businesses or forced on businesses to, to uh, report on means that the amount of complexity around describing a product is going to be much deeper, but it's also going to evolve over the time of that journey. So depending on where you are, if you're at the producing part or you're at the distributor part or you're the retailer at the very end, you will have to stack up all that consumption information that has happened while the product was in your custody. That journey is what product information in the future is going to be much more about, and that's going to change how we think of businesses, it's going to change how we think about product information. Back to your first point, that was why I took a stake at InRiver. And this is exactly where InRiver comes in, because they're dealing with product information management, or PIM, as you like to call it. So just explain to us in a nutshell how that works in practice. Right. So product information is really all the information you can imagine about a product. So when you go online and you tell, you read the entire story of your product, it's, it's all from the sizes, the weights, the information. But what is about to come very soon is also how we're going to bring the product into circularity. So how are we going to repurpose? How are we going to repair it? How are we going to avoid this going into the wrong waste, but are going into the right waste. All those type of information is going to be part of the product information that has to follow the product throughout the product journey. So for example, when we buy a t-shirt or buy a pair of jeans, it's not just mass production, but also thinking what happens after, how we can reuse these products. Exactly. And a, and a good example of the complexity that is about to come is that while the digital product passport is going to cover roughly 20, maybe 30 digital product passport in its initial phase. At the same time, take textile. We know that by 2030, every piece of textile sold in Europe will have a digital product passport associated to the item you buy uh, with a distinct definition of the product pass and the product information that you need to include. So whatever t-shirt you buy, all t-shirts will be described in the same way so you can compare it. The digital product passport sounds like a big undertaking. It's a huge initiative to roll out. So how should brands be preparing for this shift? Well, in short, they should have started at least yesterday. Um, some of our customers luckily already have done. Uh, Satco Nuvo, one of our larger customers in lighting, 
uh, are using our solutions to, to make sure that they follow the legislation specifically on lighting. And although that will not come with the digital product passport mode for the US, it's a good example of how you can use your product data and the product information management tools to be much more than something you use downstream for selling, but something for, for um, making sure that you expose the right data. Um, we have a number of other customers who are already part of it, Vestas, uh, Landman, and other well-known brands uh, around the world are looking into it. But key is to start as soon as possible. Not only focus on having this in your product development or the product uh, production team, but make sure this is a company-wide process. Because if you take this very large transformative approach to how you expose your product data, but you don't have the other most important part of, of your business, which is your customer in mind, how they're going to grab this data, then it's going to be a waste of time. And then we are going to potentially end up with the same challenges we've had with GDPR and some of the other uh, examples where we ask wrong people to do the right thing. GDPR was meaningful. We wanted to make sure that you and I could avoid having our data with somebody we don't want it to be with. Uh, but then we ask lawyers to create data processing agreement and cookie regulations. That makes no sense. You, you have to stop thinking about how you trace all the data. You have to think about how do we secure that we have something that has this elasticity to take all the changes that will happen to the product information when you have the product in your custody. Because that is the tricky part here. And that's where we have to think differently. So map your processes, get started, start high. Don't think only about the product team. Think about the sales team, think about the customer, get the customer in. You and I, we have to be in that meeting, not physically in that meeting, but, but we have to be top of mind of those who take the decision. Otherwise, we end up with a new set of ESG reports that nobody will read. Niels, it really seems and sounds like that we are reaching an inflection point where sustainability is no longer just a buzzword or a keyword that we throw around, but there really needs to be action uh, taken. What other initiatives do you see out there that can really change this and help us reach a circular economy? I think we have all, as industry leaders, an opportunity to, to take a stab at this. If you take total emission uh, uh, on, on greenhouse, greenhouse gases, it's 32%, uh, I believe, of it comes from the industry. Of that, another 30% 30, 30 of those 32% is just steel. So we will have a digital product passport just on steel. Now we could focus on that, but we could also just look at those 32% of the industry emission. Um, why, why would we not take the dis decision to say we go forward? We want to be competitive. We want to find the reliable solutions. We want to make sure it's affordable. Um, so, so that we reduce those emissions. And that has to be something we have to agree on uh, that we as businesses can do. Because with all respect, I'm not sure every of us think that our legislators will make the perfect legislation. They will probably make something that will help us get started, but we have to take the lead here. And we have all the opportunities, and this is a great scene to get it all started. And you're perfectly positioned right in the middle of this. How has being in the business actually made you rethink your own choices as a consumer? I think uh, I have to be, uh, you know, as, as, as honest as everybody and else. Transparent. And transparent, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I'm not perfect, but uh, I, I hope that it will be a little bit easier for me moving forward to take the more informed decision about my purchases and say, well, maybe I should buy this one as opposed to this one. I don't try to be perfect tomorrow and we all become a little bit better today. I think we have gotten a far way. Niels, to wrap up, we're here in Davos and the WEF theme this year is rebuilding trust. So just tell me, how does that resonate with you and the overall company mission? Well, I mean, the, the, the purpose of InRiver is to power the entire product journey. So, and that means instilling a level of trust throughout the supply chain, throughout the journey of any product that you and I are gonna buy one day. And I think that really resonates very well, not just with the theme, but also with the need we have to reduce emissions. Uh, so I hope that we here at the World Economic Forum, with all the world leaders, with all the industrial leaders as well, that we will take on those decisions that are required to get started in not just reducing emissions, but also make sure that we stay competitive, include the consumers, you and I, in those conversations. Stop the discussion about who's going to fund this, because that is going to be us. We have to pay it through our prices because the alternative is worse. That's asking our kids to clean it up and that will be too late. So the part of rebuilding trust is about us consumers believing and having trust that we as world leaders 
are actually going to make the right decisions so that we will be on track. That is the trust we have to build. Well, Niels, let's hope that comes to fruition and we see that trust. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.